to our show. Today we have the four candidates uh, involved in the November 4th uh, state election. Uh, we have the incumbent Senator Richard Moore, his challenger Ryan Fatman, and later we'll have incumbent Representative John Fernandez, and then his challenger Mark Reel. With us today is Senator Richard Moore. Welcome, Senator. And Thank you. Why do you want to be reelected? Well, I have always gotten involved in politics and starting as a selectman and then as a state representative. Uh, with the idea that it's an opportunity to help people and help the communities where they live, the communities of this region. Uh, it's something I learned from my parents who weren't very political, but they uh, were always involved in activities in the, in the community in Hopedale uh, of helping their neighbors and helping other people uh, in various community projects. And um, I've taken it a step further, uh, probably to their dismay, uh, to get into politics, uh, but I found it to be, if you work at it and you work uh, cooperatively with others, both parties actually, uh, both branches and when you're talking about the legislature, um, it's an opportunity to really get their respect, their trust, because you work hard and, and you don't steal their ideas, you work with them and, and help enhance other people's ideas, uh, and then to, to get them implemented, to get the past legislation which is um, not that simple uh, because it means in the House getting 81 members at least uh, to support an idea and in the Senate 21 members. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been pretty successful at doing that and things like um, getting the funding to uh, complete the project at Milford Pond, which I you know the selectmen in particular and people that live around the, that part of the Charles River uh, have wanted for some years to uh, clean up that area and make it turn it into an asset to the community uh, as if a recreation. Um, to do things like getting, as we did this year in the budget, uh, a $50,000 grant to help the Milford Youth Center, uh, which is going through a transition because of the renovations that the town uh, has voted for the uh, the old armory, mm -hmm. which, by the way, Marie Prenti and I helped to get given to the town for a dollar uh, a few years ago. Uh, but to, it's, a, it's a historic building. It needs a lot of work, as the townsfolk know, uh, but it's a great facility for the youth of the community. And uh, they need some, a little extra money this year in order to provide for that transition and the, the rental of some space to uh, keep the programs going while the, the construction activity and the removal of asbestos, all the kinds of things they have to do with the, the old armory. Uh, to one of the biggest, probably the biggest employer in the region, and certainly in Milford, is Milford Regional Medical Center. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been very actively involved with uh, Frank Saber and his team um, in trying to help them uh, stay afloat as the as a leading community hospital uh, to uh, get grants up to I think close to a half a million dollars in grants for uh, medical uh, records, electronic medical records that will. Uh, improve patient care because it'll provide the information from the hospital to the skilled rehab facility or to whatever the next step is uh, for a patient and uh, make sure that, that uh, the information gets properly transferred to the next caregiver. Uh, I was certainly involved having been a, the health chair in the Senate uh, for a number of years to encourage the Edward M. Kennedy Community Health Center to move, uh, expand from Worcester uh, to just across the street from our studios uh, here in Milford. Uh, things like that that you can only do if you work at the job, uh, if you, you know, spend time building the trust and the, and the respect of your colleagues. Uh, and, uh, and I've done that over the years, and I have now hold a, a leadership position in the Senate uh, as the president pro tem, which is like the second or third, depending on who's you, who you're talking to. If you're talking to the majority leader, he's second. If you're talking to me, I'm second. So it's. Uh, it, it varies uh, a little bit by that, uh, but uh, I, I think that I've already shown that I can del deliver the, the goods basically to the people in Milford and to communities throughout the region. Uh, and that's important for a legislator to be able to do because there's a lot of competition for 
uh, how we allocate the, the state budget. Um, I've, one of the er issues that has been uh, a concern for people in Milford because of a couple of rather horrific um, accidents, or maybe I don't know if accidents even the right term for it, but uh, a situation where a couple of our residents uh, were killed because the drivers were not entitled to a license because they weren't citizens uh, here. And uh, the only thing that, that's, been, that's moved so far to try to correct that problem is, is a bill that John Fernandes and I worked together on and actually in a bipartisan way uh, got some changes made so that you do need to prove your citizenship to register a motor vehicle. Mm. Uh, so I, I think we're making steps to, to change that piece within the ability of the state to, to deal with it because a lot of it, uh, the control of the borders, things of that nature, is ultimately a federal responsibility. But we do uh, get the, uh, the cost and the, the, uh, both the social cost and the, the monetary costs. And I've been pushing our congressional delegation to make sure that if there are people here in the community who came across the border or overstayed their visa, and if the federal government hasn't so far has yet to solve that issue, that they should be helpful to the, to the state and local governments with providing for the cost of dealing with that, because there is an additional cost for people to be here that aren't paying their, their share normally mm -hmm. as everybody else is. So I, I think that, uh, that that's, I've demonstrated in the pa that in the past and up through the present, uh, that I can, uh, can effectively serve the people of this area and help a lot of people, certainly on, a, on constituent relations. Uh, my office is very good and I have some great staff that I've been uh, pleased to be able to hire and retain over the years. Uh, people who are also committed and dedicated to the uh, voters and the, the residents of, of Milford and this area. Uh, and who work very hard to try to uh, solve the problems that, that come to us, whether it's by email or phone call or in person as I'm, uh, I try to attend as many community functions as I can, uh, and oftentimes with, uh, with my wife, Joanne, and uh, it's not just to be out there to be sociable, but it's out there to be available so that if people have uh, concerns, uh, they just want to tell me some, what they think about some issue or they have a very specific uh, problem, uh, then we need to be able to address that. Hey, Dick, we have uh, two minutes left on your allotted time. Uh, what else would you like to tell us about why people should uh, work well, to keep you in office? You know, I, I don't think we're certainly not totally out of the Great Recession that, that plagued us for the last several years. There are still a lot of people in our area and in Milford and near, nearby communities who are hurting. They're not, uh, they, they might not have a job yet. Uh, they might not have the kind of job they had before that was paying. Uh, I think we're in a time where we're gonna have, we know we're going to have a new governor. Uh, and a number of new statewide officers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we need people who can have a kind of a steady hand uh, and make sure that this area has the, uh, the a voice that gets heard and actually acted upon, not only heard, you know, it doesn't do much to go out and hold press conferences and yell at people uh, and complain. You've got to actually be able to do the job and get things fixed. Our guest is Representative Ryan Fatman from the town of Webster. Ryan is running uh, against incumbent Senator Dick Moore for the local Senate seat. Al? So, why do you want to be elected? Thank you for the question and one adjustment. I say I'm running for better Massachusetts, not necessarily against any one individual or any one political party. I believe in a Massachusetts that people are proud to call home where people want to live, have a family, spend the rest of their life, invest as business owners. And to me right now, that's not the way Massachusetts is. Um, I got involved in this race because for the last four years as a state representative, I've cast my votes one way in the House of Representatives, trying to keep taxes down, make Massachusetts more affordable, and trying to return some of the money to local communities, making sure that they're funded adequately with local aid, reform the welfare system so that we can save money and bring back accountability. Uh, one example, the EBT card being used for things like alcohol, tobacco, products, lottery tickets, gambling, you know, people know that's not welfare. It's unfair. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that I've been fighting for in the House of Representatives, 
bringing more security to our public benefits program so that if you're a legal Massachusetts resident, you can get access if you need help. But if you come to this country illegally, that that's not the case. And on the other side of the, uh, you know, in the Senate, Senator Moore has had an opposite voting record and, you know, erased some of my votes in the House. And to me, this is about trying to make a difference. Um, I've never believed in being comfortable. I've never believed in just sitting in one position my entire life. I believe in proactively trying to change Massachusetts and making it a more affordable and accountable place to live. Um, for me, it boils down to just home. My wife and I, uh, we got married about a year ago and we were really surprised when we had to give out our social security number to set up our internet, our cable, and our telephone. And the reason why that surprised us so much is in Massachusetts, if you sign up for things like housing, health care, different sorts of public benefit programs, you don't necessarily need a social security number. In fact, in some instances, our law states, you don't need to prove that you're a resident of the state. And so to me, this is just part of the old way of doing things. Um, we can bring a lot of accountability back, implement laws that are commonsensical, like require a social security number to get access to any public benefit program. So we know that you're a United States citizen, a legal Massachusetts resident, um, you know, make sure that that welfare system EBT card can't be used for things like alcohol, tobacco products, lottery tickets. We've made some progress on that front, but you can still go to the ATM and pull cash out of the system and use that cash for whatever you want. I believe in a cashless system. And then one of the biggest issues I've heard when I've been knocking on doors and out on the campaign trail is this gas tax tied to inflation that goes up and up and up, but never down, just up. And to me, that's not right. Uh, it goes to the heart of accountability. I believe that Massachusetts and our state government needs a lot more accountability. Um, and to just take an issue off the table and say, oh yeah, we'll allow um, you know, inflation to raise taxes, that's not right. Um, we get elected to do a job, and that's to debate and to vote on ideas of the day. And so if people have the position to raise the gas tax, they should be willing to vote on it year after year. Um, the other problem I have with it is that it's really about, you know, our government's supposed to be of the people, by the people, for the people, not above the people. And so the politicians who voted to raise this gas tax also get paid to drive to work, which is a perk that I don't think many people, average citizens, really get. Um, and that ranges from up to $100 a day, as low as 10 but to me, it's just not right. And so I think we need to get, a rid, get rid of that political perk. I've always said I would never take it. Um, you know, that was one of my promises when I ran for two, in 2010 for state representative. I said, I know a lot of people who can't even go to work because they don't have a job. Uh, why should we be paying politicians to drive to work in addition to a full-time salary when they're also allowed on the IRS to write off gas mileage uh, 55 cents a mile? You know, to me, it just wasn't right. And so those are the types of things that I've been fighting to try to reform. They're the things that I'd like to try to reform in the state Senate. I've always made uh, two promises every time I've run um, that I don't just want the job, but I'll do the job. I've never missed a vote in the last four years as a state representative. Uh, when people don't show up to do their job, they typically lose their job. You know, so I, I make sure that I show up 100% of the time. I am 787 votes for 787 votes. I've made that promise never to get paid to drive to work. And I also said that I won't vote to raise taxes because I think that Massachusetts, like families, has to live within their means and make sure that it's an affordable place for people to do business, for families to live, uh, and government needs to reflect that. Those are the reasons why I'm running. Um, I ask for people's vote. I've been asking for people's vote since March as I've campaigned across the state. I was going to joke, did you hurt your hand uh, knocking on doors? Knocking on too many doors. You know, <laughs> it's just one of the perils of campaigning. I got a little bit of poison ivy, and, uh, you know, you tend to lose your mind a little bit as the schedule goes on. And I also forgot my tie, which, you know, I left at home. But, you know, these are the stories that I've heard time and time again that I'm describing. And, and one thing that j I think is really important to this area is the immigration problem. Um, you know, for me, the immigration problem comes down to seeing people and meeting people who have done it the right way, spent their time and their treasure, and become United States citizens. I feel it's unfair to those people who have worked so hard um, to have a system that's not working for the average everyday person. And to me, that's what I'm all about. Hi, with us is uh, State Representative John Fernandez, who's running for re-election to a uh, two-year term. Al? Tell us why you want to be re-elected. 
why I want to be reelected? Oh, why? why I should, <laughs> should be, be reelected? Re Both. <laughs> Both questions. That's good. It gets hard at this time of a campaign to yes. <laughs> ask yourself why. Uh, no, actually, I had decided to run for re-election, you know, when, when I sat down with my wife and we talked about it back in January, whether another term made sense. And, um, you know, it's been a long eight years. No. I came in, there was no recession. Things looked good. We were still on the uptick. There was some instability, but things were, were going well. The recession hit, and it didn't take long to realize it wasn't going to be the typical year and a half recession. This was going to be deep, and it was going to be long. And it was pretty clear that um, it was probably going to mark most, if not all, of the time that I served there from forward. Um, it's been difficult, but rewarding. Uh, there have been problems, but opportunities. Um, people were hurt. Uh, it feels good to be able to help folks when they call and they're having a problem, to be able to access resources and do something about it. But as we start to come out of the recession, and we have, the last, this past term now, um, this opportunity that, that I think I'd like to be a part of for another couple of years. Mm. Opportunity to, um, as we see businesses grow, we'll see revenue grow to the state. As we see revenue grow to the state, there's more we can do for communities uh, to help restore local aid that was cut, um, to help advance education, um, to help with some local projects like we've done in this budget. And um, there's opportunity to do things like we've tried to do with the opiate addiction issue, putting money into those, mm -hmm. those resources to provide more beds. Um, and I think there's an opportunity which, you know, Senator Moore and I have grabbed onto the last year and a half um, with a focus on manufacturing as one of the industries mm -hmm. in Massachusetts that is on the move. People don't recognize it necessarily in their everyday lives. They don't see it but we have 7,000 manufacturers in Massachusetts projected to um, have as many as 100,000 jobs in the next 10 years that will go unfilled unless we provide a competent, trained, able, and willing workforce. And matching those two things up are pretty stubborn, actually, because of the mindset that people have about what manufacturing is, and it's a much different industry today than it was before. And I actually see it as the opportunity to recreate uh, a middle class in Massachusetts because the jobs are working with your hands but it's not the manufacturing of old some of it is but a lot of it is working with computers to run machines from across the room mm -hmm. run robots um, and the pay is forty fifty sixty seventy thousand dollars a year um, the kind that's of pay that those people, are good jobs that's the kind of pay that people can can work on but the most important part of it is there's a stubbornness to this economy and the recovery where we find ourselves getting below 6% with unemployment, a bit above 6% with unemployment. But getting back to the numbers that we were used to in this area, which could be in the 3 or 4% right. range, which is truly full employment, and taking into consideration people who are no longer being counted within those numbers, there are a number of people who have not recovered as a part of this, this um, economic recovery. And the stubbornness I see is particularly evident among younger people out of high school, and older displaced workers. And there are pilot programs that we've been running that I was at a graduation for just last Friday, 11 people. They're small numbers, but it's a 12-week program, 11, 15, 20 people at a time, and maybe 150 people have gone through it, young and old, displaced workers, mm -hmm. people have been out of work for a long time, with 12 weeks of training, are out getting jobs because there's a curriculum we can put in place that manufacturers are comfortable with is a baseline certificate and certification to get into these industries and into mm. these jobs. And we're creating opportunity. And you know, I remember when Draper's closed, and I've told this story before, my dad worked there for 35 years. It's all he knew. He came in from Portugal when he was three years old, never got out of high school, worked at Draper's. His service was only interrupted by the time he spent in the U.S. Army Air Corps in World War II. When Draper's closed, he was an older man. There was no place for him to go. Nobody wanted to hire him. So he cobbled together a couple of years' worth of work and then took early retirement. That lesson doesn't leave me. Mm. And when I see folks in their 50s and 55, 58, 60 who can't find work, that's my dad. And we're not going to be able to say we have a full recovery till we're done with that. 
and putting those people back to work. So I see the opportunity in the next couple of years with the recovery coming on that we can continue the effort that we've started here with manufacturing and other industries to provide those jobs. So that's why I want to stay for a couple of more years and see if I can do something with that. Well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. It really is. Any, any highlights of, of the last eight years? Oh, I don't. I, you know what the highlights, there's, there's three parts of this job. There's the constituent service stuff. There's the stuff we do with the local communities, and there's the legislation. I've had highlights in all of them. You know, when I work with a single individual, like I told you, somebody who's been waiting for eight weeks in, for an unemployment check and finally picks up the phone and calls and says, can you help us? Right. And it's, yeah, we have backdoor legislative liaisons in every agency because they don't want 200 legislators calling right. every agency. So I can pick up the phone and I can make a call and say, what is taking so long? That's a real success to me. Yes. And I can go home smiling with that kind of thing. You know, when, when the Hopedale Police Department needs 30,000 bucks or whatever the number was because they got dead spots in town with their radios and we can get them that money, that's a high spot for me when we can do that. And getting the opportunity to write legislation that's been stubbornly unable to be changed over 30 years, like alimony reform, mm. or getting to be a part of working with George Peterson, your friend, um, who's been a dear friend to me, and I hate to see him go, yeah, but working uh, on the gun bill that was that was stalled and ready to be defeated when, when that, he and I got together. That's something quietly you haven't taken enough credit for, in my opinion, well, is getting that log jam through where you, you helped rewrite a bill that appeals to both people who don't like guns and people who hunt and shoot. Well, yeah, you know, when, when the bill first came out and we had waited 18 years, I mean 18 years, 18 months to put a bill out after, yep. after mm -hmm. Sandy Hook because the speaker took his time and put a commission together. Right. And you saw the legislation that was 55 sections that had stuff about school safety, that had stuff about uh, mental health Ill, uh, uh, access and mm -hmm. background checks and all the rest. And when I went through that and I looked at goal, the Gun Owners Action League response. There were so many things they said we're neutral on or we think this is a good idea and it was down to like a half a dozen plus provisions that they were poison pilled on. And I went to George Peterson and I said, George, are you reading this the same way I'm reading it? Because I, I think we're close to yes. Can you get to yes on this? And he said, I think I can if. And I said, well, I'm in the same place as you. Coincidentally, the speaker calls the both of us in and says, will you guys work with a small Mm. group of legislators, a couple of other legislators, they gave us three weeks, we put together the solutions to those half a dozen provisions and boom, we had the success of Coalition for Gun Violence and right. Goal behind a bill. Unprecedented nationwide. Yeah, absolutely. But in terms of taking credit for it, so many people put their hands on getting that bill together over the years. If you push it over the goal line, are, are you the champion? Are they the champions? You well, know, everyone. Everybody put work into that okay. thing. So I don't want to overshadow okay. the work that went into Hi, we're with Mark Reel, who's a Menden Selectman, who's running for state representative. Welcome. Oh, um, tell us why you want to why you want to run and why you want to be elected. Sure. Well, you know, I've, I've I've thought a lot about this in the past, and um, I I was park commissioner in Menden for a term and and ran for selectman and um, really ran for selectman to try to help the community as best I could, and have come to realize that as a selectman it's not easy to make some some real serious changes and it's become very apparent that it's really the state level where we need to to make some change and I can't do that as selectman so I thought I'm gonna run for for state rep and and hope that people will take a good look at what's going on and so far I've met thousands of people going door to door and have heard that things need to change. People are tired of what's going on in the state and some of the biggest issues that I've heard about have been illegal immigration that's really rocked Milford and the state really. Um, the welfare abuse and fraud is something that it's, you know, every door, these issues are coming up. Local aid, our communities are being mandated to do all sorts of things, and we're not getting the funding to do so. So, and in return, we're seeing property taxes go up. So those are some issues that I've really felt strongly about, and I've not seen action 
from our current representative to address those issues. Um, he's John Fernandez is the current state rep, and according to the the House, the clerk of the House of Representatives, he's voted 100 percent of the time with the Speaker of the House, and there's only 31 representatives that have voted 100 percent of the time with Speaker DeLeo. There are quite a few, out of one out of Cambridge, Newton, uh, Dorchester, that don't even vote 100 percent of the time with the Speaker. So I wonder, what, what are his priorities? You know, we, we in Milford, Menden, Hopedale, Medway, we're not Boston, and our interests are much different than Boston. So I'm looking to go to Boston and address and work hard to take action on some key issues. Like I said, illegal immigration. We need to take action. It's unsustainable. We should not be, the taxpayers should not be flipping the bill for illegal immigrants getting mass health, EBT cards, uh, public housing. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to address it. It's, it's just not working. The state auditor came out with her audit, nine and a half million dollars in fraud. Where's the action? We need to protect the taxpayers. Communities are struggling to pave roads, to provide resources for our kids to go to school. We're not seeing action to increase local aid. The, le the legislature had an opportunity. There was $75 million in lottery money that is supposed to go back to the cities and towns. Voted against it. Only $25 million went back to cities and towns. That's just one example of the lack of action. So people really have a clear choice to make, and that's, that was my goal, is to give people a choice. Option one is to vote for the current representative, John Fernandez, and expect nothing to really change. We cannot vote for the same people and expect a different result. It's just not practical to think that. Or we could pick option two, which is vote for me, Mark Real, who is a selectman, who sees what's going on, who works for a small business. I work at Southwick Zoo as the assistant operations manager. We're seeing time and again policies and laws that don't promote growth in the business world. Small businesses are struggling. If small businesses are struggling, jobs don't happen. It's just not going to work. We, we, we hire nearly 200 students, high school and college age students, who are looking to build the basic skills for the future of our job pool. And when we see our, our legislature, including John Fernandez, vote to increase the minimum wage from $8 to $11 an hour over three years, as a growing business, we can't continue to hire the amount of people we do. And it puts a roadblock for many small businesses. A local coffee shop I go to every morning brought up to me. They said, well, we're either going to raise the price of our cup of coffee to six, ten dollars, or we just go out of business. So we need to have a government, and, and that's an option too. I'm going to actively go in the communities, talk to people, talk to businesses before I vote and say, how is this policy or law going to affect you? Is it going to help you or is it going to hurt you? And if it's going to hurt the majority of people, we don't do it. So again, option two is myself, something new, change the status quo, and let's take some action.